I am Grace Boykin. I visited 20, over 22 countries, had a very interesting life with lots of lots of adventures. And you traveled a lot and you're, you, what do you, are you a novelist? I am a, a storyteller. I have over six different books, uh, fiction, nonfiction, uh, memoirs, and uh, have a very uh, interesting background from my family. South of the Hill that will be coming out soon, and, and it's the political years of Frank W. Boykin, who was a U.S. congressman from Alabama for 28 years. It's interesting in the fact that back then, Hoover and Truman and Eisenhower and Kennedy, it seems like they all worked together, the Democrats and the Republicans. We don't have that anymore, unfortunately. So I bring that back into the book. What's interesting is my grandfather, back in the day of Truman, he was actually... um, from the floor of the House, they could nominate someone for vice president and president. We don't have that anymore. And a lot of people don't realize that. But he was nominated along with, um, I think it was with Truman. He and Truman, the two Truman brothers, they also developed Homosassa Springs, Florida. So I have a lot of untold history in my books. They also, my grandfather also fought the Ku Klux Klan, uh, and they called it the Counter Klan, which was your Jews, your Catholics, your whites, your blacks, and they all wore robes of green. And so they fought the Ku Klux Klan back in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, the southern states. But he spent $700 of his own money back then for the robes to get to the people and they would ride on their horses and into the campfires and they would extinguish them. But it was an interesting um, bit of history back then with the counter clan. And a lot of people don't know about it. And it was in the 1885 uh, to the 1959. So a lot of your travels, what are those books about where you go? Or is that just like stuff that inspires you to write a story? Um, both. I have a, actually a autobiography of myself that's like a self-help book. And in that, I actually have a travel log of all the countries that I've visited and the sites that I recommend for people to see. And I start the book with questions, which is very unusual that people would do that. But I have about 25 questions that I ask people it kind of helped me to be able to do that and then to answer those questions for myself to find out who I really am. Similar, but side note, when I used to put on acting classes, I would ask the actors, what is your motivation? Fame, money, women, what? Because the answer wasn't <laughs> important, but the answer is important to them because, uh, you know, you don't hide from yourself. Just like your questions there, when you answer them, you'll better know what you really want. That's true. Yeah. And I also, I have to tell you, I think what you do is wonderful. And I listened to your last, another podcast that you had with a gentleman that you had known for over 28 years. I enjoyed listening to that immensely. So this lets me actually get to know him even more. We share the promotion. <laughs> That's right. And it's good that we have an outlet that can do that. And I also have Grace Boykin Media, and I have a little media company that I do, but it's mainly for doing book descriptions or finding titles of books for people that can't find their titles. But I find that I always start with my title, and that's the way my book starts. For my scripts and books or whatever, it's, it's just one little simple thing that kind of sparks the idea. And then it just kind of runs <laughs> and it takes off. <laughs> and it plays, which people don't understand with me, it plays in my head to where I don't even know the ending. It's almost like I'm watching a movie in my head. I don't really think of a script to be like, oh, can I have a twist here or a turn there? I'm pretty much watching like somebody else tell it to me in my head to actually, I get to see it before everybody else <laughs> i think you have a fast moving brain i think it, it always needs to keep moving so i feel like i'm getting somewhere in the last four or five days you were like 
the 13th podcast and I'm stacking and racking them, even though I got three movies I got to edit. <laughs> so it's like, wow. I, I kind of put a lot on myself. What inspired you for some of your books? What what was the be there? What's your motivation? Well, with I, I just got through writing probably the hardest book of my life, a diagnosis of cancer um, of my son that had three different types of brain cancers at different times. The emotions were coming, the tears were falling onto the keyboard. My motivation was the fact that I wanted to honor my son. And I wanted those with cancer to know all the different emotions that go through. Emotions that you can't even describe. So that was my motivation for that book. My grandfather, the same thing. My sister passed of cancer, so I understand what you're saying. It didn't sit well with her that they would come then. You know what I'm saying. When, I, when, I do. You know, I, I didn't want to spell it out, but most people know. You know, it's it's everybody waits until the end. We We don't really, we can try to imagine what it is. But that's got to be a rough feeling, too. Yeah, and especially he he was 32 when he died, and he didn't want to die. So that was the hardest part. My is, sister was 37. Yes. And it's just too young. But with my other books as well, A Turbulent Life, my, my autobiography, self-help book, I wrote because of all the experiences that I, I've gone through. I kind of had a... Family abduction is what I would call it. So the emotions that went through with that was very difficult as well. But we've gotten over it and I've forgiven them and, you know, all is well. And I, I tell about, like I said, the travel log and all the, the good things too. Happiness, sadness, and it all goes with life. Most people create to try to get people to relate to it, whether it's entertaining, heartfelt, and then the Southern hunt, like I said, the good clan versus the bad clan, but also it's about hunting. And I grew up with hunting. And and so it, it's there again, it's about another experience. And it's a lot of fun. And the history that is told, even when I'm sitting at a deer stand and I'm watching the deer in the field, I have my computer going and I'm writing the story as I go. My grandfather, what this is an interesting little side tidbit late 1800s early 1900s he worked for the railroad as the water board and he had a commissary the commissary sold everything i mean it had coffins it had guns coca-cola this black man comes in and he says let me see that newfangled gun up there and so my grandfather says okay sure so he gives him the gun he looks at it and he says how much is it he says forty dollars I ain't got no $40. And he says, well, I can give you, uh, let's, what do you have to trade? Go and say, well, I've got 80 acres of no good land. Well, does it have trees? Yes. Does it have a railroad track? Yes. So my grandfather said, well, let's go look at it. So they go and look at it. And on that 80 acres, later on in life, they found five salt domes to store oil and gas. He made lots of millions throughout his lifetime. His first million, a hurricane came and struck it out with the trees that he had, but they always grow back. History plays a big part of it. I was a teacher and taught history. So that's probably my first look. Do you self-publish? Do you have a publisher? I, I do have self-publishing. Now I'm with a media company that has been doing my books. Over a hundred and some movies, and I still haven't even sold any. Mine is just create, create, create. <laughs> you got to get out there, market, market, market. I know. That's what everybody tells me. <laughs> Trust me. One lady sat me down. And she was like, Jimmy, you got to stop. You don't go from one project to another without market, market, marketing. And I was like, yeah, but everybody's different. And mine is, I guess, I mean, it's a sad way to say it, but it's make as much as you can product wise before you die. I don't want the stories to die with me. When you have multiple stories, there's not enough time in a day to do them all. <laughs> I basically tell everybody I'm the factory worker of movies. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that will make them. I don't need anybody. I just turn the camera on and do it myself. But afterwards i'm on to the next now i'm even doing the podcast <laughs> right, right. i always branch out it's 
I think it's more so just to uh, take the challenge. Well, have you thought about charging for your podcast? Because it's very good Everybody what you do. kept telling me It really that, but is. I wanted to try to build it up. Like, you know, I I have been finding that a lot of people like you are very appreciative of me. Mine was, I was, not that I want to veer away from you guys, but I thought marketing wise, you know, you got to get the celebrities and all this. And to do that, you need a, a big base. And then I would be Right. able to charge. But I, I'm finding it that the, the writers and the people that aren't in the spotlight, oh man, they're loving me. <laughs> you Yeah, know, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I got set up like a composer, a boom operator. <laughs> you know, these are the people that like, I'm never going to have a podcast. Jimmy's doing it. I'm there to where I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> it's just too many. <laughs> Most people don't believe it, but I'm a very shy person. Uh, I couldn't even look you in the face outside. But when I'm filming, there ain't nobody better. <laughs> you know, I'm like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. <laughs> So I need to keep this going because I like this person that is open and can talk to anybody and do anything. So. That that's fantastic. And you can make money at it too. Well, like I said, I'm, I've already opened the door and I, I close the door every now and then I get like about 16, 18 podcasts and I close the door and say, Hey, I need a month, month and a half to finish all these. And then when I reopen it next time, I'll probably say, <laughs> it's just too many. I'm going to need a couple bucks. So Well, it's so good that you give up your time like this. You got I made a big heart. a, I made a good connection. Everybody's opinions are so different, you know? They are. And I actually today opinions are really Badly different. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but everybody's opinion should be different. You know, you should do what you like. You should, um, you know, support what you like. Do you actually have uh, places that you film that are on location or... I've used different places. Actually, years ago, I was like at the top of my form to where I could get locations, funeral homes and all that. I... Really like just filming, like kind of in my house studio, even though the next four movies, if you check them out, you're going to be like, that's the same living room in each one. <laughs> it's four different stories, four different actors, but it's like, it's the same location. And trust me, my ex-wife is always jumping on me about that. But there's so many things that you got to think of. You need a comfort zone. Besides that, the world is a different place and people aren't as motivated to come together. So really, even if I'm doing a movie, I don't start until they walk in the door. In my mind, it's always, oh, they're going to call and cancel. They're going to call and cancel. Oh, everybody's here? Let's go. It's it's just the way the world is. I mean, I can make a... I can make a story about anything. <laughs> you can pick up a cup behind you and I can just start writing the whole story about a cup. We have a 1905 antebellum home that is just absolutely, I would love to see it for a writer's conference or um, it would be wonderful for a film. Uh, we, we have lots of honey acres on it, lots of trees, of course, but um, and we have ponds for fishing. The antebellum home is just beautiful. We also have a ghost that we call Miss Agnes. I got ghost She... stories, so they don't bother me. <laughs> yeah, if I was there, I'd, I'd shoot a movie. All you got to do is uh, say a couple actors show up. Jimmy's filming. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I go fast, too. Kind of got me in trouble because we shot like half the movie over in one day really quick. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Dealing with actors is just as bad as dealing with people that, ha you know, own the locations. <laughs> Well, do, have you ever used family members as actors? Yes. Yep. I mean, anybody that the good thing And about how does that work? well, usually they're usually just extras or whatever. But the the thing about me is I'm really good at making anybody look good. Mm And -hmm. the same thing goes with the podcast. That's why I take my time and I'm be like, look, I'm going to cut this up. When you're talking, it's going to go to you. Everything I do. I make sure I do it the best I can. So if somebody is a better actor than another person, I've done this for 32 years. I know how to make everybody look good. My uh, one uh, about my son, uh, it's being made into a screenplay. We all can't collaborate because we butt heads. <laughs> <laughs> right. But the intention is there. <laughs> you know, Definitely. 
Right. Definitely. I'll work with anybody. I'll do anything. I just want to keep doing this rather than to like work 12 hours in a factory to where this talent that I have, I can't use. So especially when you have an active mind. I've been on some job thing and they're like, you know, well, sometimes there's nothing to do and it's kind of boring. I was like, I can't be bored. Not in my mind. Trust me. I can't be bored. <laughs> Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I don't want anybody listening and saying, but I'll probably be the only person that could actually live in solitary confinement and not go crazy because <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's so much going on up here. It's just like a Netflix. South of the hill and then the diagnosis of cancer. Yeah. Uh, it's right there with the Southern Railroad. And that's where my grandfather, interesting story about him too was when he proposed to his wife, Asla, she did not want to have anything to do with him. He had only gone to blab school, and a lot of people don't know what a blab school is. It's out in the field with locusts, and that's where he learned his ABCs, his numbers, but that's all he, the schooling he had. And yeah. his wife was an English teacher and, and graduated from college, which really helped him to become a congressman and to go as far as he did. Is that what you want to make the story about, the, the movie about? Yes. It, it Actually, there was going to be a movie from for him. And it was going to call, his motto was, everything's made for love. And that's what we would probably title it. So I have a script that was done, uh, not a whole script, but Breed Love Productions back in the 30s, but it never got made. That I know of. I don't know if it's sitting in a can somewhere, but you, they had to come up with the funding. And back then, they were talking about $900,000, which is way over into the millions now. I appreciate your time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Enjoy talking to you.